Hey everybody, it's Cece Bell, author and illustrator of the book El Defe. So today we'll be talking about chapter two, but before we start talking about chapter two, I wanted to reassure my readers that yes, I do wear glasses, I still wear glasses, but I don't make, rather, I don't wear the glasses um, when I film these videos because for some reason it makes me feel all cross-eyed. There's something about looking closely at something with my glasses that makes everything ooh, loopy. So I don't wear my glasses when I make the videos for that reason, but I do have them. The other thing I wanted to discuss with you is a little bit about why I even wrote this book. The whole thing started when um, I was about 40, 10 years ago, and I noticed that I was having a lot of difficult interactions with strangers. And sometimes when people think, or rather, when you ask somebody to repeat themselves more than once, they start to get angry. And that's really an unpleasant situation to be in. And what I should have done in those situations was simply say, oh, I'm deaf. You need to change the way you talk so I can understand you. But I didn't have the words to say that. And in fact, I realized that I had never said I am deaf out loud to anybody. And I was 40 years old. So I was kind of angry, not at just at the strangers, but at myself for not being able to simply say, I'm deaf, I wear hearing aids, you need to speak up, kid, or whatever. But um, I didn't do that, and I was angry with myself, so I thought, I need to write about this in some form. So I started this um, blog, this website, and it's not on the internet anymore, but it was also called El Defe. And I just wrote about some of these difficult interactions. And then I wrote about the hearing loss itself and what that was like and being able to hear my teachers wherever they were. I started, all that stuff just came pouring out. And a really good friend of mine, Madeline Rosenberg, who is also a writer, and her most recent book is called Cyclops in Central Park. And it's awesome. And you should check it out. But she was reading the blog and she said, oh man, you need to turn this into a graphic novel. And I thought to myself, huh, she might be right. Because at the time I was reading Raina Telgemeier's Smile, which is probably the main reason any of us graphic novelists, mid-grade graphic novelists are even here is because of the book Smile. Raina changed everything for everybody. So I was reading this book and just loving it. I love that book so much. Um, and so I thought, well, yeah, this is autobiographical. Maybe I could do something like that. So then I started to read Scott McCloud's book, Understanding Comics which is mind-blowing, and everybody should read this book, especially if you're interested in creating your own comics. So I read that a couple times, and then I thought, I'm doing this, I'm ready, and so I jumped in. And I kind of started that whole process, and I wrote an outline, and I did that very first chapter mock-up kind of thing, and I sent it to an editor, who happened to be working with my husband. And my husband is Tom Engelberger, who writes the Origami Yoda series. And we've also done some books together, like Cranky Doodle and the Inspector Flytrap series. And we've known each other forever and ever. We've been married a long time and we have a very good time together. Um, but anyway, he was working on the Origami Yoda book and his editor, at that time was Susan Van Meter. And I was so impressed with Susan that I thought, man, she is the right person for El Defo. And so I sent her the very first outline and the first chapter and she really liked it. And the book would not be what it is without Susan. Her input was just 
incredible and valuable. We work very closely back and forth and Susan and I have become extremely good friends, which is always nice when you end up making new friends. And um, we share a lot of the same interests. And one of them is we both loved Holly Hobby as a kid. So I drew a little portrait of her as Holly Hobby. And there she is. Doesn't she make a good Holly Hobby? She's a sweetheart. So anyway, that's a little bit about how I got started on the book. And now we can dive in to chapter two. Okay, moving on to chapter two. Chapter two begins with me wearing my beautiful red bikini bathing suit. It's been two weeks since the hospital. Just because I can't hear good doesn't mean I can't look good. I love my bathing suit. I wear it and nothing else every day, everywhere. So that is absolutely true. I had this beautiful little red bikini bathing suit that according to family legend, I wore every single day for about nine months straight and I didn't wear any other clothes. And who knows, but I think my parents were um, pretty easygoing and loose and they figured if I was comfortable, they were comfortable. But I absolutely have this memory of looking in a mirror and wearing that bathing suit and looking myself over and thinking, oh man, I look so good. Wow. And so why would I wear anything else if I had that much confidence in how I looked? I have not felt the same way in many, many years. But back then, I thought I looked pretty, pretty good. So the chapter continues with me having to get dressed. And, of course, I didn't want to do that because I knew that I looked my best in my bathing suit. But I did get dressed, and the reason that I had to get dressed is that I had to go to an audiologist. So, if you've read this book, you probably figured out that an audiologist is a, um, almost like a doctor, but more like a person who tests your hearing and tries to figure out whether or not you need a hearing aid. So you'll see on page 15 of the book that I'm interacting with the audiologist, but all the speech balloons are empty. And you probably noticed some of that in chapter one as well. And of course, that's there for a reason. And that's there because I'm trying to show that my character is having a lot of trouble hearing, can't hear anything. And if you were confused the first time you saw this book and you wondered, well, where are the words? What's happened? That's there for a reason. I want you to be confused. I want you to feel the way I felt back then. And so you end up having to do what I had to do and what I still have to do, which is use my eyes to look around and figure out what's happening. So empty speech balloons on this page and the audiologist on this um, in the following pages um, is based on several audiologists from my childhood but the person who I was actually visiting that day was a man named Dr. Martin Linhart and he was an audiologist at the Medical College of Virginia and he is the one that helped me. But when I was working on the book, I ended up um, needing photo reference. That means um, pictures that I took that I used to help me get a better sense of what I needed to draw. So here are some pictures of um, the audiologist that I had from about the age of five until maybe about the age of 45 or so. Um, my favorite audiologist, his name is Dr. Reidenauer, and great guy, and as you can see, very, very funny, very funny guy. So he took, I went to his office, and he took a lot of pictures with me, and um, or for me, and it really, really helped with this section. So 
back to page 15, the audiologist at that time, Dr. Linhart, really did ring a big cowbell and I didn't hear it. And so then he directed me to go into one of my least favorite places in the whole world, the um, hearing testing booth. So that little booth is very small and not pleasant and you're going in there for something that you don't understand. At least that was the case when I was a kid. I didn't understand what was happening and it was all new and scary. And so to this very day, I am very, very, very claustrophobic. And the word claustrophobic means that I am afraid of being in small places, small spaces especially. Um, a good example of that would be elevators. And those of you who know me and have actually spent time with me know that um, I will take the steps no matter what. Although I will take an elevator if that's the only option, but if you're riding an elevator with me, be prepared to hold my hand and also be prepared to see me cry a little bit and get very, very, very nervous. I turn into a little animal in the elevator like my lizard brain kicks in, ah, get me out of here. And I hate, I hate all of it. And I especially hate when the elevator doors take forever and ever and ever to open. Terrifying. So anyway, I think that all started with this little booth. I really did not like the booth. But page 16 continues with the audiologist doing this hearing test for me. And most hearing tests are comprised of listening or hoping that you hear a certain series of beeps at different pictures and the beeps are like beep, boop, bah, beep, beep, all kinds of sounds up and down and all around and some of them you hear and some of them you don't hear. And the second segment of the hearing test is the audiologist saying words like hot dog, airplane, butterfly, and you are not allowed to look at him and you're trying to say the words back. But in the book, I only show the beep part because that's the part I remembered better. So from that, um, from that test, the audiologist determined that yes, I had some significant hearing loss. And in the book, in the very last panel on page 17, I show that test, that audiogram. And in real life, the audiogram that I used is actually from a little bit later um, because I couldn't find the very first audiogram that I ever had. So I used a later one that was, um, was actually the hearing test that they did when they were trying to figure out, they in this case being a new set of audiologists, they were trying to determine um, what kind of hearing aid I might use for school. So anyway, the audiologist says, yes, she needs a hearing aid. And so the next part is the audiologist making impressions of the inside of my ear and also known as the ear mold or earpiece. And what happens there is the audiologist puts a, um, this gloop in your ear, just sticks it in and it's this compound that sits in your ear for a little bit and you can feel it swell up and it swells just really gradually, but it feels really, really cool. It doesn't hurt at all. It's actually a really neat experience. And then eventually he takes the um, impression out and you have this funky little shape. And that shape, that little mold, gets sent to another place and they make an earpiece for you. Um, and that's pretty cool. So continuing on after that, um, after that kind of stressful visit with the audiologist, I get a lollipop 
And if you were a kid in the 1970s, getting a lollipop was part of everyday life. Um, you go to the bank with your mom, you get a lollipop. Go to the doctor's office, lollipop. Dentist, lollipop. There you are, you've gotten your teeth cleaned and they give you more sugar so that you'll come back with cavities. Lollipops everywhere, lollipop, lollipop. Oh, lolly, lollipop. Anyway, so I got a lollipop and it was cherry and that was the best. So then on page 19, it's a week later and I have to go back to the audiologist and this time I get my very first hearing aid that was um, a little back with two cords and earpieces. And I don't have that hearing aid anymore. So I've got this picture that sort of is an approximation of what it probably looked like. But in the picture, there's only one cord. The one I had had two cords. And that was little and very different from what I wear today. Today I have behind the ear hearing aids, there's one in this ear and one in that ear. And I'll take them out and you'll notice something. Here's one, very little, and that's the earpiece. I have to put a little bit of tape around there so it fits better. Here's the other one. And so that's the earpiece that all that gloop helps to make the mold. That's the earpiece. So you'll notice though, that these two hearing aids are different. They're not like each other. That's because a little bit before all the coronavirus stuff hit, my dog chewed up my hearing aid and I will show you that dog. Here he is. Doesn't he look cute? Don't you just want to hug him and pet him and kiss him and love him forever? Well, this dog, Esso, is the dog that chewed one of my hearing aids. Ah, and I was devastated. And what made it even worse was it wasn't the first time it happened. It happened to me when I was in the seventh grade, too. But that's another story. Anyway, anyway, he chewed up one and I thought, oh, no. What am I going to do? Everything's closing. I'm not going to be able to get a replacement. I'm going to go crazy because I'm used to being able to hear with two hearing aids. Hearing with just one was really, really hard. Ah, but I got lucky and I found an old hearing aid from a long time ago and it worked well enough to get me through this. So I think I'm going to be okay. But eventually I will get a new hearing aid to replace this better one. So you've noticed I haven't been wearing these for all this time. And believe it or not, that means I have not been able to hear myself for all this time. But I think I'm talking to you just fine. I can feel my throat vibrating some. And I've, got, I've had enough practice talking to know something's coming out. But I'll put them back in. And we'll move on with the story. So that little hearing aid was indeed the very first hearing aid that I got. And when the audiologist turned it on and turned up the volume, you'll notice in that speech balloon at the bottom of page 19 that it's, it starts out light and gradually gets dark, but also that the words that start light and get dark they don't make much sense. And you can probably figure that out. The volume's getting turned up, but the words don't really make sense. And that's because, as you can see on page 20, I can hear, but what are they saying? In other words, I can hear with my hearing aids, and this is true now, and it was true then, I am able to hear quite a bit with my hearing aids, the problem is comprehension. I can't understand what's being said. And that's because that the kind of hearing loss that I have, which is severe to profound, um, means that I can only hear vowel sounds. I can't hear consonants. So vowel sounds are A, E, I, O, U. 
those sounds I can hear. But what I can't distinguish are the differences between M and P and B and SH and CH and T and L. Those don't make any sound. So that means communication can be very, very difficult. So yes, like on page 21, yes, I am able to hear. I just wasn't able to understand. And then when um, he gave me the hearing aid and I looked at myself in the mirror, I wasn't real pleased by the way I looked. It was just so different and unusual. So he did give me that little orange um, polka dotted pouch for my hearing aid, which I wish I still had that thing. I loved that thing. I thought it was the most beautiful fabric I'd ever seen in my whole life. And I loved that little pouch and that helped things a whole lot. And it also helped that yes, I got another lollipop. And so on the last page of this chapter, chapter, chapter two, page 22 of chapter two, um, you see me putting my bathing suit back on. I get to go home, I put my bathing suit back on and then I put the hearing aid in the pouch on top of the bathing suit and I look in the mirror and I'm not so happy with the way I look anymore. So I went from being very confident to being not confident at all in a matter of days. It was such a big change and I knew that something was different and something was, or rather things would never be the same again. So that's where chapter two ends. And when we come to chapter three, we'll find out a little bit more about um, how will I communicate? What am I going to do if all I can understand are vowel sounds and not consonants? So before I leave, I'll check my notes and make sure that I didn't miss anything. And I think I got it all. So next time, I'll see you and we'll talk about chapter three. Thank you so much for tuning in and I'll see you soon. Stay well. Bye.